Hey everyone, it's Dr. Andrew War here. I just want to say hello to everyone. Um, I wanted to come on and uh, do a little presentation because today I saw a release um, and I've put it up actually on endometriosis in Australia, the prevalence um, around hospitalizations and also what it does you know, for women and, and how much lost revenue um, and that, that this disease causes each year. Now, I was talking about it. We know that one in 10 women have been diagnosed with it. And as I always say to people is that, you know, one in 10 is seriously, um, yeah, it's <laughs> those figures are seriously underrated because one in 10 are diagnosed, but then it takes 10 years or more to be diagnosed. Now, let's say seven years, but look, let's be honest. Um, some people have taken up 20 years to be diagnosed. So that means a lot of people have been missed and dismissed along the way. And I see them here, you know, I see them in my office daily that still haven't been diagnosed. So, and you know, they've got it. So, and there is some talk now that every woman actually has endometriosis, whether it's been expressed into the body um, or not through various ways or genetic pathways as well, because there is a genetic component, hereditary component to it, that if your mother has endo, then there's a high likelihood that, you know, a daughter or someone might as well. So there is, genetics is probably where it's all going to come to. And I often explain it to that I have a genetic condition where I get high iron. Um, body doesn't allow me to absorb and process iron properly and it's due to genetic mutations and I honestly think that's where we'll end up seeing where endometriosis come from. Don't quote me, I'm not saying that's where it is at this present, but genetics is, there is a lot of works around genetics. Now a lot of people actually every night say that there's not a lot of research being done on endometriosis. There is around the world, there is a lot of stuff being done. There are a lot of people behind the scenes doing a lot of stuff to political lobbying and all kinds of things. Um, so it is getting there, but it's not enough. Um, and the money that was being offered um, for research and stuff on endo at the moment is not enough as well. Now, the part of the reason why I wanted to do this post is that uh, someone this morning thanked me for saying that, it, that endometriosis just isn't about pain um, or period pain. Because as I always say to people, period pain's not normal, which it isn't. Period pain's not normal. Can, before people with endometriosis <laughs> jump up and down, it's normal for you now because you have endometriosis. Yes, those that suffer for it, from it, period pain, is part of their life or pain is part of their life, but endometriosis just isn't about period pain. But period pain is not normal. It's not normal. It means that there's something going on and there's a high likelihood that um, those with bad period pain do have endometriosis or undiagnosed endometriosis or something like adenomyosis. But adenomyosis usually cause a lot more bleeding issues. That aside, I want, Whenever we discuss endometriosis, it's always about period pain in the news, in the media and things like that. Endometriosis causes more symptoms than just period pain. And it isn't just related to the period. We see women get endo flares and they get endo belly where they look like they're nine months pregnant. And that can be any time. You get things like that can blamed on food intolerances and things that they just ate and all those kinds of things. It's got nothing to do with what, well, to a point. <laughs> um, certainly foods can flare endometriosis, that's for sure. Alcohol and um, certain things can flare endometriosis and if you've overdone it, stress can flare endometriosis. Anything that creates inflammation can flare endometriosis, but it's more than just period pain. We need to understand that. Um, there's many symptoms from the IBS-like symptoms to the bladder issues, you know, the UTI-like symptoms, the ovulation pain, the dark clotting, um, the pelvic rectal pressure, uh, as I said, the endo belly um, migraines can go. And let's not forget the emotional and psychological aspect of endo that I see um, a lot of women with endometriosis have underlying anxiety that isn't being addressed. I've done some recent posts on anxiety because anxiety will ramp up pain levels too. It's, it's, 
it's a little bit what comes first, the chicken or the egg, because we know when we're in pain, well, of course, anxiety is going to go up. But we also know that if the underlying anxiety isn't addressed and then that becomes a chronic anxiety problem, those things are, affect pain pathways and turn pain pathways on. And sometimes those pain pathways are really hard to turn off, um, even with medication. So this is why we try and teach women, uh, you know, relaxation and parts where that mindfulness, I think mindfulness is probably more to the point. And we know that through mindfulness techniques, there can be that up to 70% of women will get a reduction in their pain. Um, there are apps like the Curable app and things like that, that that's primarily what they are actually doing is um, they're teaching people relaxation, mindfulness techniques. And we know that that does help pain. But I just wanted to talk a little bit more about that, that, you know, endometriosis isn't just period pain. We've got to stop referring to it as just period pain because it can have pain can happen at any time. It can be constant for some people. Then the other thing is what I see, because I do a lot of work with fertility, couples with reproduction, stuff like that, significant portion of women with um, endometriosis are asymptomatic. So they wouldn't even know it's there. And it's only that once we go into a laparoscopy as an investigation for part fertility evaluation that we find that they, they've, they've got it there. So there is that part of it too. And a lot of other women that get all the symptoms go, well, aren't they lucky? Um, but at the same time, with proper treatment, proper management, proper care, and seeing the right person, you can get you can get symptomatic relief too. I know a lot of people go, but I've done everything. I've done, you know, I've seen everyone. When I hear that, often they've seen the wrong person. They might have seen everyone, but there, we also know there's communities that just don't have that care. The other part is that sometimes even if you haven't seen the right person that that say someone has surgery i was talking to a surgeon the other day and i'll give an example and he said i went in um to do some he's an advanced trained surgeon he went in to do some surgery and he pure, he went in to do more an investigative thing and found out this woman had all this endometriosis on her bowel and everything like that. And he said, look, I had to purely do an investigative laparoscopy on this woman because when I want to go in next time and I'm going to take a bowel surgeon with me, he said, I could have done a lot of it, I chose to leave it. But he said, because I'm that sort of person, I saw one of her ovaries was stuck around behind and stuck to a bowel and something and, and and adhered. And he said, I just couldn't help myself. I just lifted it off <laughs> just a little bit. He said, lo and behold, I spoke to the patient afterwards and they said, oh, a lot of my pain's gone now. I, wh what did you do? And he said, I, I didn't do anything. And then he went, oh yeah, I just moved that little bit of a adhesion that was contorting that ovary and stuff like that. And then he had to explain, he said, you know, sometimes even if we don't do a great job, that even the littlest amount of surgery can produce a lot of symptomatic release. But then he had to explain, well, the problem is in about three months time, you're gonna be back having the same amount of pain and stuff like that. Um, because it's created like a healing response with the body and it's shut down some of the pain levels, but he didn't really do anything. The endo was all still there and the bowel and everything. But he just said, it just made me realise that when people are being underserviced with the surgery, because if they haven't seen an advanced trained surgeon who specialises in the excision of surgery, and these advanced trained surgeons are very, very skilled. Um, they've done extra training, you know, years of extra training on top of a normal gynecologist. I've talked about this before. <laughs> you can't just see anyone for endosurgery. And the other thing is they do lots of surgery. They do more surgery than anyone. So they are capable, skilled surgeons. So they're the ones you want to see, a bench trained surgeon who specialise in the excision, not ablation, the excision of endometriosis. Um, and they also specialise in the excision of endometriosis. So they're the ones you want to see. But I just want to explain that because sometimes people go, well, I saw this person and I've had some release and then all my pains come back. So this is why we always say your first surgery should be your best surgery. And um, yeah, and it's true. If you see the right person first up, it could save you a lot of multiple surgeries. And that's why a lot of people end up going back and back and back and back. 
Um, but we also know despite the best medical interventions that people are still in pain. And this is why you need that multimodality approach that I always talk about. Um, but you see the right people for some. That's what I do is I help coordinate people to see the right help, right management, get the right surgeon, get the right help. And that's how I help people as well is giving the right management moving forward along some alongside medical interventions and everything. Um, enlisting people that could be, you know, counsellors, um, pelvic floor specialists, surgeons, whatever we need to help that people, um, psychologists and things like that as well. But um, the point of my post is that I've gone on long enough again, <laughs> um, was to say that, you know, we need to get it out there that endometriosis just isn't about period pain. Um, it's never been about period pain. There's a lot of other associated symptoms that go with endometriosis as well. And I urge everyone that if you haven't been diagnosed and you are in pain and you do have period pain and any other associated symptoms that you're not sure of, then see the proper people. You've got to see the right so and that's the hard bit. Um, but there will be ways later on, which I'll explain to people through um, um, some of the uh, programs that I've got, going, like the uh, endometriosis experts that we're going to get up and going, that we all know that they are experts in what they're doing. Well, hopefully that's helped. Um, yeah, it's great to see that some of the reporting that's happened in the government, um, that report today, um, it's good to bring, highlight what's happening. It's quite sad on other levels, um, seeing how bad and how much it does cost. Um, but um, at the same time, I saw it's just about period pain and endometriosis being painful. It's not always explaining that there's a whole lot more to endometriosis and the emotional aspect. It's not just about hospitalizations. There's a lot of other stuff that go with endo. All right, um, take care. And um, for those that are the endo sisters, keep up the good fight. Um, make sure you go and see, the, you know, like keep up the resources, go and see the right people. If you haven't seen the right people, if you haven't seen the excision surgeon, go and see one. Um, if you don't know where they are, you can always PM me. Um, yeah, um, other than that, keep up the good fight. Let's end the silence for women with endometriosis and um, help them get the support they need. Take care.